Hi, welcome to the third event of the roundtable series on the early learning care facilities, focused on the greater Los Angeles area. This series is hosted by Build Up California as part of our Building Blocks for an Equitable Recovery Initiative. Today, we will discuss one of the most challenging aspects of child care facilities, how they are financed. So my name is Erica, and I am the Policy and Program Officer for Early Care and Education at the Low Income Investment Fund, and I support Build Up California in this role. Before we start, I want to share some information about logistics with you. This webinar is being interpreted in Spanish by Maria Jose Araujo. So, si desea escuchar este evento en español, Haga un clic en el icono del globo terráqueo en la parte inferior de la pantalla. If you want to listen to this webinar in Spanish, you click the globe. Vamos a revisar. That are awesome. Followed by a Q&A session. Please use the chat or the Q&A function to share your insights and questions with our guest speakers. I would like now to introduce our moderator for this discussion, Jessica Coria. Jessica is the Senior Manager for Southern California in the Community Development Department of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. I have the pleasure of working directly with Jessica as part of the Investing in the Future of Child Care Initiative team. This, is in, this initiative is an example of her work on fostering strategic partnerships with cross-sector stakeholders and community partners to address the barriers to economic opportunities for low and moderate income communities. Jessica, thank you so much for accepting our invitation to moderate this round table. And now it's with you. Well, thank you so much, Erica and the entire Build Up California team for hosting this great round table series on ECE facilities. Um, as we are highlighting at these, uh, all of these events, facilities are a key element of creating a high quality childcare experience in centers and family childcare homes. A well-functioning comprehensive ECE system must include investment in facilities as without additional physical spaces, we are unable to incre increase supply to meet our ever-growing demand for childcare. At the San Francisco Fed, we have a dual mandate to support stable prices and a thriving labor force. Access to child, affordable childcare is crucial to parents' ability to participate in the workforce. Through the Investing in the Future of Child Care Initiative, we are working to support child care providers as the essential businesses they are by strengthening the business model through access to training, technical assistance, capital, and government support. And today we are very lucky to share information and insights on financing childcare facilities in the greater Los Angeles area with our four panelists. So now I'll introduce each of them. Jennifer Allen is the executive director of the Long Beach Day Nursery, which is one of the oldest licensed child care centers in California. She believes that ECE is a primary strategy for reducing intergenerational poverty and loves to empower collaboration between people and organizations, something I couldn't agree more with. Thank you so much for being here with us, Jennifer. We also have Dr. Maria Lupe Hyman Milham. She's the Deputy Director for the Child Care and Development Division at California Department of Social Services. After over 20 years as the Senior Director for Early Care and Education at Fresno County, Superintendent of Schools, and the Deputy Director at Central Valley Children's Services Network. She was appointed to her current leadership position last January by Governor Gavin Newsom. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation to join us, Dr. Jaime Mahon. Next, we have Angie Garling, the Vice President for Early Care and Education at the Low Income Investment Fund. Angie and I get to work together on the Investing in the Future of Child Care Initiative, which is part of her role in overseeing LIFT's ECE facilities development, programming, policy, and strategy work. For 25 years, she has served as an advocate, funder, policy analyst, researcher, and program developer dedicated to quality care and, and education for all children. I couldn't be more pleased to work with her and of course to have her today in our conversation. Thanks, Angie. And last but not least, we have Tony Varengo, who's the Vice President at Credit and CDC Small Business Finance. T 
Tony is part of the senior leadership team at CDC that oversees commercial real estate lending products. This includes SB 504 loans, new market tax credits, and a partnership with Morgan Stanley where they are the outsourced due diligence arm. He has been with CDC Small Business Finance since 2005. Thanks so much for being here today, Tony. So let's get started. We want to kick off this conversation with the provider's voice. So Jennifer, can you please share with us your experience as Executive Director of Long Beach Day Nursery on financing ECE facilities? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this roundtable and share our story. I'm Jennifer Allen, the Executive Director of Long Beach Day Nursery. We were founded in 1912, making us one of the first licensed child care providers in California. We are one of only three accredited child care centers in Long Beach, which means we have voluntarily undergone a comprehensive process to assure high quality standards in all areas. We provide two healthy meals and a snack every day and have one of the only early intervention programs in LA County, where any child enrolled can receive early intervention assistance year round at no cost to the families. We serve approximately 300 children a year, ages six months to six years old between our two branches. Long Beach Day Nursery has a mixed funding model. We hold infant, toddler, and preschool contracts with the California Department of Education and the Department of Social Services. We have families who pay full fee for services and we fundraise with individuals, corporations, and private foundations. Our effort to finance our facility upgrades and expansion plans aligns with our general mixed funding model. So I'd like to share some context around our expansion needs, which ties into these multi-tiered and diversified revenue sources. The journey for the Long Beach Day Nursery expansion project started when the LA County Child Care Needs Assessment was published in 2016. This report highlighted the gap in services, especially around LA County, where there were only 13 licensed spots for every 100 infants and toddlers. When you look at infant care slots, that availability drops to roughly eight slots for every 100 infants across the county. Additionally, our West Branch is located in a zip code which was identified as one of the highest need areas most lacking in licensed zero to three care across LA County. It is considered a child care desert. With our strong history of forward thinking paired with the experience of providing zero to three care at our East Branch, Expansion for zero to three services rose to the top of our 2018 strategic plan. As such, we intentionally recruited new board members to support our strategic plan goals, and we began to increase internal capacity as well. An expansion committee was formed, and we have focused not only on the physical part of expansion with experts, but other items that will help us be successful, such as technology, community partnerships, a new brand and website, fundraising, staff recruitment, and professional development for our team. In addition to our internal call to action, LBDN worked to ensure access to infant, toddler, early care, and education was captured in the Long Beach citywide ECE strategic plan. Unfortunately, predictions show that COVID-19 will cause two out of five childcare facilities to close permanently, only amplifying the childcare crisis. LBDN has spent the past year and a half outlining the specific details of how we could expand our services, and we believe now more than ever that our ability to increase our impact is absolutely necessary and timely. Having shared all that, I'd love to walk you briefly through our actual expansion plans. It's very exciting. We have phase one in the green here, which was completed in 2019. We renovated a classroom using expansion funds from our early Head Start and Child 360 partners. Phase two will provide two new toddler classrooms over here and is partially funded by a private foundation. And we are looking for additional resources to complete this project. We've sent proposals to Congressman Lowenthal, Lowe's Home Improvement and private foundations. In phase three, we will renovate our historic building to provide infant care at the site. Phase four will provide a new two-story building, which will hold not only preschool classrooms, but space for our very important early intervention program and a community, community meeting space, which is very rare in the neighborhood. 
We've outlined these phases to enable us to continue providing services while we create these new classrooms. If funding permitted, we could build phase three and phase four at any time. We just need $2.3 million to make this happen. In conclusion, Long Beach Day Nursery has a long standing history in the community. We are grounded in our mission and we work diligently to build partnerships and strengthen relationships with funders. We've relied on our strong teaching team, our solid reputation and a needs-based approach to pursue funding opportunities and achieve our dream of providing infant care in a child care desert. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jennifer. So next up, um, we really would, are excited today to have um, Dr. Lupe come and talk to us about um, the work of the Child Care and Development Division at the state facility, I mean, at the state on child care facilities and the new Child Care and Development Infrastructure, Infrastructure Grant Program. So take it away, Dr. Lupe. Thank you, Jessica, for that warm introduction. And again, happy to join everyone here. Um, so I have to first take a moment to share the excitement that we have that in the 25 plus years that I've been in this field, I don't think we've ever seen such a robust budget that really does um, call out our um, child development and development system in such many ways. And as, um, as these investments has shown. And so big thank you not only to our champions, which is our, our governor, but as well as our legislative champions who have continued to, to carry this work for us, as well as the many advocates that um, have spent countless hours in this work. Um, and so as part of the California state budget for the child care and development system, um, Governor Newsom announced that there was going to be that there is 250 million and a one time federal and general fund to be used for funding infrastructure for child care facilities, focusing on child care deserts. And so as a result of the pandemic, child care services and facilities have suffered tremendous loss, as we're aware. Many of the child care facilities have hazarded conditions and demands for quality child care is high, but yet insufficient sometimes to meet the needs. And so the trailer bill, budget bill, assembly bill AB 131 specifically states that the department shall administrate the child care and development infrastructure grant to expand access to child care and development and preschool opportunities for children up to five years old by providing resources to build new facilities or retrofit, or renovate or repair or expand on existing facilities. And so this is um, quite a remarkable investment. Um, and AB 131 sets aside funding as part of the infrastructure block grant to be used for activities to improve the quality of the childcare. The infrastructure block grant consists of a total of, like I mentioned, the 250 million. That's broken up very specific. 150 million is for general um, fund resources that can be used to finance new construction or renovation of existing buildings and 100 million provided through the American Rescue um, Act of 2020. So ARPA can be used to for smaller renovations, which would be more minor in plan. The ARPA funds must be liquidated by September, 2023, making this a high priority to ensure that we're able to get this out the door. Um, the other piece that I would say is when looking at the 100 million, which is for the minor renovation and repairs. We're partnering with our community care licensing partners to look at what type of um, infractions, for example, have occurred that we can address perhaps with these dollars to ensure that everyone that is currently right now um, licensed really does not leave the field because of a renovation that they're not able to achieve. So it's something that we're currently analyzing the data for and taking in consideration. Since the ARPA dollar funds must be liquidated by September 2023, it would be best suited to tackle on these first. The department is currently attending many roundtable discussions such as this, bringing back feedback and currently working on timelines in regards to the best course of the funding. 
We will be doing this through a request of an RFA that will be out to the field for a competitive process for these dollars. All those applying for the RFA must meet the certain criteria as listed on AB 131. And when application are received, the applications would be scored um, to determine what funding, um, what funding will be distributed. Since the application, the RFA is currently not out, what we would share at this point is that we are still receiving feedback from many of you and, and others. So we encourage everyone to continue to provide us feedback in regards to thinking about these two different pots of funding. The infrastructure grant may be used for the following, and I'm just gonna recap some highlights of this um, pieces. So what the one-time infrastructure costs, including but not limited to the universal design facility, renovation, renovating, retrofitting to meet licensing requirements, the cost of design, engineering, and testing, as well as um, related removal of hazardous substance, et cetera. Um, I know that I believe my time is almost up, so I'm going to just pause there and um, yield back um, any, any time if, if it was left. And thank you, Jessica, for this time. Thank you, Dr. Lupe. I'm sure we're going to have questions um, about your presentation. So we'll say, I'm glad we can save some time for that. All right, Angie, um, please, I'm really, really interested to hear about, you know, the pieces that your work has in with regards to financing child care facilities, which because I know Lyft has had a long history in, in making this a reality. So take it away, Angie. Great. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so the it, it's it's really great to be here. And what I would like to do today is talk a little bit about the low income investment fund and our work um, in in housing as well as in early care and education. So um, what is LIFT's mission and vision? And you know, why as a community development fi financial institution do we care about early care and education? So we believe that everyone in the United States should benefit from living in a community of opportunity, equity, and well-being. And what LIFT does is mobilize capital and partners to achieve this vision for people and communities. So uh, the way that we really work to do that is by centering racial equity. And we have a very big goal of driving $5 billion in investments over the next de decade to advance racial equity. And you know, we feel like early care and education is a very core part of that. And so the two main ways that we are really focusing on achieving our mission is through investments in housing and early care and education. So LIF is a national organization. You can see on the slide, everything that's in blue is an area where LIF has made investments. And um, we currently have offices in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Atlanta, New York, and Washington, DC. And we have a national reach, but we really have a lot of staff on the ground and targeted solutions to um, addressing the uh, problems and issues that we are faced with today. So how does a community development financial institution work? So basically we get money from investors and partners, public and private. Uh, we are called an intermediary. So then we process and leverage that funding and then we um, lend and grant money out to communities. And in terms of housing, LIF is an experienced off balance sheet fund manager. We administer for the state of California, for example, uh, the Golden State Acquisition Fund and the Bay Area Transit Oriented Affordable Housing Fund and the Bay Area Preservation Pilot. So some of the highlights of our housing work in California is um, almost half a billion dollars in off balance sheet funds, as well as additional investments in developing housing. So in terms of connecting housing and early care and education, we are also looking at opportunities for co-location of housing and early care and education. In terms of early care and education in California, almost exclusively in California, but in other parts of the country, we have created enhanced or preserved 280,000 spaces with $213 million invested. Our primary, primary early care and education work is in the San Francisco Bay Area, Washington DC, New York City, and Los Angeles. And I'm gonna talk a little bit in future slides about in more detail about the work that we do. But first I wanted to talk about the COVID-19 response. 
Most of our work at LIF has been in facilities financing and business sustainability, but we really pivoted during COVID to business sustainability to just ensure that providers could keep their doors open. We initially set a $5 million goal and ended up marshalling over $40 million in repurposed government funds, private philanthropy, and referring people to the payroll protection program. Uh, we were really uh, glad that we were able to marshal those kinds of resources and we have um, a lot of providers who have been able to keep their doors open and to keep their bills paid, which we know is really important to our sector and to our economy in California. Um, so in the child care funds that we have had, we have identified some key ingredients and I wanna go over those with you. The first is it really helps to have public funds to anchor the, to anchor the process and really offer a range of financial products. And I wanna say how important it is to do that, not just for centers, but also for family child care programs. As you may have seen on the previous slide, focusing on family child care was a huge priority for us in, during the pandemic because we realized that family child care providers often tend to re, be more heavily reliant on the private market. And when the pandemic hit, they were losing a lot of, um, uh, a lot of enrollment and, and, and still are centers that rely on the, public, on the private market as well. So we wanna make sure that we have pr uh, financial products for family child care providers as well as centers. So for example, we have uh, expansion grants, startup grants and repair and renovation grants for family child care. And then we have construction, acquisition, planning and pre-development grants for centers. Uh, it also, we believe, is, is critical to have private funding to leverage those public dollars, so public dollars go further. Uh, and we uh, are, are able to do that, have been able to do that through the New Markets Tax Credit, which I'll talk about in a moment. The other thing that is really critical is technical assistance and training. Uh, it is not the top job of a child care director, although I, I'm very impressed by Jennifer's um, you know, knowledge and expertise in the capital development project. Uh, this is probably not something that child care directors start out doing. You know, we want to make sure that they can spend as much time as possible developing their quality program, managing staff, interfacing with parents. And so technical assistance is very critical in this, in this way, particularly when we are working in areas where there is not a high supply or uh, long time uh, providers who've been around for decades. So that is very important. Also looking at supportive policies to maintain and expedite the early care education pipeline. That is also very important. And we have some examples in San Francisco of how we've done that. Um, and then, as I said, capacity building is really important, not just for the operators, but also for financial institutions so they can offer tailored products to ensure that ECE providers can uh, benefit from them, but also for ECE support organizations like resource referral agencies and first fives. So some additional financing resources are the new markets tax credit. So what is a new markets tax credit? Basically, this is a, a financial tool that can be used to help uh, programs and housing developers and others acquire and finance property where they have an a smaller initial upfront investment. And then after seven years, they are able to get a lot of equity in their property. So we were able to do this with two pro uh, properties in San Francisco with two early care and education operators in a very high cost area. So that's one innovative product that can be used to leverage public and private funding. There's also low income housing tax credits that can be paired with a co-located property with housing and early care and education. Uh, I, I'd like to highlight San Diego and Sonoma, which were able to get uh, congressional and state resources for childcare facilities and uh, bridge loans. So San Francisco offers a bridge loan to providers who need it for um, cash flow issues. And then there's small business loans and Tony's gonna talk a little bit about that next. So I just wanted to end by reading two quotes from our Los Angeles providers who were two of 700 providers that we were able to provide grants to thanks to the city of Los Angeles. And Nina Munch from the D 
DIG Child Care Center in Santa Monica said, when I found out that we got the lift grant, I felt like a huge weight came off my shoulders. It, re it felt really validating, like somebody noticed the importance of the work that we were doing. And I wanted to just emphasize how important that is because that is something that our sector feels often. You know, during the pandemic, many of them felt like at the beginning they were left behind and how important it is to think about not just public investments, but private investments, and not just at the city level, but the county and the state and the federal level. And Maria Garzo, this is a translation from Spanish. She says, I'm very happy. It's helped me tremendously. And I've used the funds to pay rent and pay bills for food and to keep her business going. So those are some of the ways to think about financing uh, childcare. And I want to turn it back to Jessica and um, also hear from Tony and uh, take any questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Angie. Yes, we have some questions already um, in, in both the Q&A and the chat. We'd just like to encourage people to make sure to continue to share those because we've definitely reserved time today um, for questions. So um, now I'd like to invite Tony um, to come on screen. I'm really excited to hear about the specific um, types of capital that you have available at CDC Small Business Finance for early child care and education providers. So take it away, Tony. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Jessica. So a little bit of an overview of our organization. You know, again, uh, Tony Barango from CDC Small Business Finance. We are a nonprofit 501c3 um, small business lender. And um, we were founded originally in 1978, and um, our, you know, our founder, Art Goodman, you know, really had a passion for helping, you know, minority uh, communities and small businesses. Um, there was a push in the Carter administration at that time to try to get investment into those communities, and they came up with what were called um, local development corporations, and you know that was a good match for our founder, Art. Um, to, to create one of those companies and, and, and try to get investment into minority owned communities. At that time, you know, we were really limited to one product. So we had a um, commercial real estate product. So owner occupied, um, you know, real estate to acquire, you know, to acquire a building that they wanted to operate their business from. So, you know, the eighties came, you know, we continued to grow and expand, um, you know, started to get into new markets in Los Angeles and other, you know, parts of Southern California, uh, eventually into Arizona and into, um, you know, Northern California and, and Nevada uh, with our real estate product. Uh, at the same time, you know, we developed a um, direct lending, you know, non-real estate product, which we can offer nationwide. Um, we also, you know, as an organization, you know, do strategic planning. We, you know, focus on verticals that uh, we think have, you know, room for growth um, that are going to meet and align with us as a, you know, from a mission perspective, and also that, um, you know, are, you know, within what we consider, you know, sound credit parameters. You know, so I think before the pandemic, we, you know, we did a big industry analysis and childcare facilities, you know, met those, you know, kind of check those boxes, you know, from a mission perspective, you have a lot of female entrepreneurs, uh, a lot of minority entrepreneurs as well. And then the employers within these companies are also oftentimes, you know, females and, and minorities. So a good match from a mission perspective for us, uh, from the credit perspective, you know, we do research on uh, default rates and historical performance. SB is pretty good about providing, the Small Business Administration is pretty good about providing that type of information um, and childcare facilities, you know, we're within our, our comfort range. And I'd say lastly, you know, we're limited in loan size for non-real estate um, loans up to 350,000. Um, but primarily 250, 250,000 for our primary product. And, you know, you can do a lot with uh, working capital loans, with uh, loans for TIs, you know, to redo a, redo a classroom, you know, rebuild a um, playground or working capital to hire uh, new teachers, you know, things like that. And that's a really good match for our non-real estate program uh, with our, you know, our loan size maximums. Um, you know, touching back again on our financial products. So, you know, we have our primary product on the real estate side. 
is known as the SBA 504 product. Uh, I think the distinguishing factor for that is it's a 90% advance. Um, so that means as an entrepreneur, you're only required to put in 10% as a down payment, um, which you know helps you retain capital in your business and you know use that for other purposes, hiring, expanding, you know what have you. We also have a new market tax credit, small business loan fund um, that you know can also do a 90% advance. And, um, you know, again, affordable capital to hopefully get people into real estate, uh, maybe acquire the facility you've been leasing or, you know, um, open up a second one, you know, things like that. And then lastly, again, touching base, touching back on the non real estate product, you know, uh, primary product is called our 7A or SBA community advantage product. And again, the use of proceeds there, you know, pretty wide. So, you know, general business capital for hiring. Um, you know, construction for building out, you know, a childcare facility, new equipment, um, you know, or any other kind of sources under there, acquiring an, an existing center, you know, maybe you wanted to buy one that was already up and running, you know, we can finance business acquisitions under that product as well. So, you know, we offer really a, a whole suite of products, and I think they're great for this particular industry. You know, like I said, the loan sizes for, you know, the non real estate are really in the wheelhouse of, you know, what some of the, the needs are. And then on the real estate side, you know, the 504 has a pretty high cap. Um, you know, 5 million is is the max debenture side for us. And again, that, you know, gets pretty good access to capital for, um, you know, most properties in California are going to be well under that size. So, um, yeah, so thank you, uh, Jessica. Um, that's, I think, a good overview of, you know, the products we offer um, on our side for real estate or for working capital, um, similar assets, and, you know, a good perspective of what, you know, we can offer as an organization. Thank you so much, Tony. I really appreciate, oops. Thank you so much, Tony. I really appreciate that overview of the different products you have at CBC Small Business. So I'd, I'd like to invite all of our panelists to come back on because we have questions actually for each of you. Um, so uh, let's start with one that we had for um, Jennifer. Had you been able to, um, let's see, scrolling back up. Um, have you been able to look at any expanding any facilities with other agencies that have permanently closed or have you heard about people talking about doing that in the in the sector in LA? You know, we have not pre COVID we had even during COVID when we realized we're going to have there was already a child care crisis. And now we're going to have an in, even increased child care crisis when we have uh, social distancing guidelines in the classroom were reduced to half capacity. We began to explore partnerships in the community all over with churches and businesses, empty buildings, trying to figure out how can we provide the most space available, not with uh, centers that have permanently closed now recently, but with centers who a center that had been closed for some time. The remodel expenses for us to do that to bring a new building or a center, a previously used center up to the high quality standards that we have was just out of our reach at that time, especially when we're dealing with all of this COVID, new COVID um, kind of demands. And so that's when we decided we're going to focus on our internal expansion project and really develop the plan to use our current campus. Thanks so much for that. That makes a lot of sense if you already have kind of like an area that you're trying to currently expand. Um, for um, Dr. Lupe, the, in terms of the ARPA facility renovation grants, are there enhanced be, enhancements beyond health and safety infractions that are going to be considered, um, that will be considered quality enhancements? So some of the examples given were classroom sinks, conveniently located bathrooms, improved lighting, air quality. Yeah, so, so thank you so much for the question. Um, that is the type of feedback that we're currently receiving. So um, definitely would welcome to see if um, individuals can provide us that specific feedback. We haven't specific landed on um, the prioritization of lease funding. Um, at this point, we're only looking at some initial data from our community care licensing. But of course, we're always open to receiving previous to receiving feedback to ensure that we're making um, the most equitable decisions in regards to these dollars. 
Great, thank you so much. Um, we had another question and I can open this up to my our panelists. And if not, I think I have one idea. Does anybody know of any programs that exist to help family child care center providers who are currently maybe renting be able to purchase a home or to more quickly pay off their mortgage so that they're able to continue to operate their family child care home business? No, anyone? I know Mission Driven Finance in San Diego has been working a lot on this. It's a pilot program that they are going to hopefully be launching later this year or early next year with this yeah. exact goal in mind. Yeah, this is Angie. I wanted to say that there is tremendous interest in thinking about home ownership for family child care providers as a wealth building strategy. We are actually in the very early stages of piloting this in Washington, D.C. with uh, family child care providers uh, as not home ownership specifically, but asset building in general uh, as uh, as a way to do business strengthening. And so I think uh, that there are examples uh, around home ownership where it incidentally educators are prioritized for first time home buyers uh, assistance programs. So that's true in Alameda County, although I don't know exactly how many educators have actually benefited from it successfully. Uh, but I do think, and I think that uh, counties like San Francisco are interested in exploring this more. So I would love to talk with other folks about this and even the state, housing and community development, thinking about home ownership um, incentives, but specifically thinking about it for business owners whose home is their business and uh, for family child care. So it would be great to talk with the Department of Social Services and others about exploring this innovative idea even more. Yeah, and I, I would just add, you know, there was a comment in the chat that uh, 504 and SBA 504 loan could work. There, it could. It just, you know, the facility, the house would have to be licensed. To you know, it have to be commercially zoned. You know, we can't do a single family residence that's not zoned properly for a business because the 504 program is uh, for owner occupied real estate. So there could be some limitations there. Although, depending on the project, it's possible. Thank you for that clarification, Tony. Um, another good, great question that we have is, you know, um, kind of going back to um, centers that are currently struggling to remain open, has there been any talk or, you know, um, about how they might be able to partner with each other so that they can expand, especially for those who are, might be considered um, closing because they're just not, you know, either retiring, I've heard that's a big issue right now ongoing in our sector is we have a lot of providers retiring um, and, and trying to continue to increase our supply um, or at least not let it continue to fall apart even more so as we've seen over the past year and a half. Any ideas of where that might be taking place? And if um, any of our attendees have ideas, please feel free to share. Right. So I, I also just wanted to say that there has been some thinking about this statewide and in California, and uh, there's been some uh, suggested legislation that um, local child care support organizations like uh, local child care planning councils could help um, uh, invent, keep an inventory of where there might be available, um, you know, open centers or open um, spaces. Um, and I think that, you know, as somebody who worked at the local level for almost 20 years, we see this uh, turnover, it, it happens, right? It's, it's pretty, um, it, it's been something we've been thinking about and tracking for a long time, turnover in leadership. And I think that one of the things that is so important is that capacity building work is really thinking about, you know, talking to providers, thinking about ha having helping them think about expansion um, and uh, new opportunities or, um, you know, because the unmet need is so large in California, uh, it would be wonderful to think about having every single uh, current childcare operator think about what their capacity and interest and ability is to expand. For the uh, funds that Lupe, that Dr. Lupe is talking about, 
uh, it would be so much easier to have local providers on the ground, particularly in areas where there is low supply, who are ready to talk to you know, real estate agents and um, others about you know, new, new spaces or um, co-located spaces or even refurbished spaces. In our experience, it actually costs more to do adaptive reuse of a space, like to convert an old school or um, uh, another you know, office building than it would be to build from the ground up. So that's you know, something good to, to keep in mind, uh, but it's also a great way to use uh, space that you, that you may already have. Thanks for that. I also wanted to kind of go over um, of several questions that was related to the timeline for the new funding for financing for facilities. And the goal is to release more data details, um, you know, next month. So, you know, really we'll want to keep an eye out in October um, for, the, for those that timeline and details on how to apply. So that's really exciting news and something to look forward to. Um, one thing that was in the chat that I just wanted to mention was whether or not we felt that, um, at least in California, universal TK might help with the um, supply versus demand. And, you know, what we know from what we've heard in other places that have taken on uh, universal TK or the expansion of preschool and schools to allow for four-year-olds um, is that it needs to be a shift. It ends up being a shift potentially in our childcare space where we need to find new ways to support the zero to three population of children. Um, they have different needs in terms of facilities. They have different provider needs. They have different ratios that are required. So all of that will require a shift potentially in our sector in order as we potentially have more four-year-olds um, attending the public school system. And so that's something while we are excited that it might help reduce um, a portion of the need that also reminds us that there are a lot of parents, working parents out there who need care outside of the traditional um, school day. Um, just speaking from my own experience, I have a son in kindergarten that is, it's full day. Um, he gets out at 1.30 every day. And um, that's on his days that are not a minimum, which is 12.30 or 12.09. So we know there is a lot there that needs to happen in terms of being able to fully support working parents um, on the hours that they need and the times that they need in order to um, have that childcare access. So just wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, we had a great question about um, uh, oh, and Angie answered it in the chat. Maybe I know they're going to be, I think, on a future webinar, right? Um, but just to mention here about um, Little Tokyo Service Center, which is having a co-located center, correct, Angie? Yeah, so Liv financed a um, development at the Little Tokyo Service Center, and Eric Takano is going to be featured as a panelist next week in our co-located uh, webinar. Uh, focus. So we really hope that you can join us uh, next week. We will also have uh, a couple other panelists, uh, Bridge Housing, as well as uh, a child care operator that operates in several um, housing developments, talking about the, the pros and cons um, of that. Yeah, that's um, one, a good plug that we are in um, week three of um, a five-week series. So please make sure to to think about registering or tuning in um, on the next two Thursdays, same time, um, same, I think Eventbrite will be, is our host for registering um, because I think we're going to continue to explore all the different facets of um, facilities and the need for them. Um, we had another question about, um, whether or not there are any infrastructure funds um, specifically around homelessness and childcare shortages. I know that um, CCRC, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, here in, in Los Angeles and San Bernardino County did do a study on the needs of um, homeless children um, around childcare. Um, maybe I can find that in the link, but if there's, I don't know personally of anything that really brings those two sectors together specifically in terms of funding, but I'll let my panelists chime in in case they have any ideas. 
Yeah, I was going to say there's a few examples that that I know. Uh, LIF has financed uh, the child care center improvements in the child care center, and we actually have a a video that's pretty uh, impressive where we basically just changed out the carpets at the Salvation Army Child Care Center in Oakland, California, which where a child care center is co-located with a transitional housing development for moms and their kids. And uh, uh, if we can find the, the link for that, uh, we, we, could, we should post that. And then LIF has also worked with the House of Ruth in Washington, DC, which focuses on um, domestic violence survivors and providing uh, housing for them. And we worked on helping to fund a child care center there. Uh, I think that there is a lot of improvement and additional work that could be done to help really think about the coordination of those two sectors too. So thank you for asking that. Yeah, and I think that's one way that, um, one reason we're really hoping as California makes a huge investment in affordable housing, um, for, you know, individuals that are currently in house families that are currently unhoused, families that are um, trying to reunite as part of the um, foster care system. Those are all opportunities where we can have child care as a huge resource in order for families to be able to get back to working or going back to school full time. And, um, you know, it, it ends up being the largest portion of their budget after their housing. So we know that once we kind of solve for the housing need and housing issues for these families, childcare is, if not the next or the, you know, the first thing that was really preventing them from being able to, to pay that rent on an ongoing and regular basis. So we know how important that is something to kind of kind of keep in the back of our mind, especially here with us at the Fed who have done a lot of work on affordable housing in the past. Um, let me check the Q&A to see if there's anything else. Um, let's see. Um, how about with, with regards to school districts? Is there anybody who has any ideas about how we might be able to better partner with school districts for those um, before and after care needs, um, especially as the state continues to think about transitioning to add um, four-year-olds to public preschool. Um, so I could just say something about this briefly, and I am no, by no means an expert in this area, and a lot of the new, um, you know, uh, budget uh, legislative language is still being reviewed and um, in very, very early stages of implementation. But some folks have asked questions about before and after school, um, as well as just coordination. And then of course, with transitional, universal transitional kindergarten. So the, the very little that I do know, and you know, maybe this is the topic for a future webinar, is that um, all school districts do have planning money that will require them to develop a plan for how all four-year-olds will have a transitional kindergarten experience. Now, as far as I understand, I don't believe that is required to have that. They don't have they're not required to have that experience be in the school district, but they have to develop a community plan. So I know at the school district level, it will be important for local stakeholders to weigh in on how best to meet the needs for those four-year-olds in their community. And then there was also a large allocation for community schools. And this is again, this is not through um, the, the California Department of Social Services, but for the, through the Department of Education, so a different agency. Um, and community schools is an area of funding that really looks at how can you meet more of the community's needs at the school. And so before and after, after school care could be a very legitimate uh, need for the community. Uh, and so again, that will off also a lot be happening at the school district level. So I think that there should be hopefully more conversations about how childcare can coordinate more closely with, um, with some of the education developments that are happening um, that came out of this very unprecedented budget. Great. I actually have two questions for Dr. Lupe. One is, um, is there a stakeholder input process for 
how the, just not the programs did all, as well as the programs design, but also how funds will be distributed. I know that there was the email for CDSS was included in the chat. Um, if people have questions or comments that they want to share there, but is there a, an additional process that you can make anyone aware of? Yeah. So um, that is actually the mo the ideal process, right? To be able to get your written con um, comments to that specific mailbox. Um, I know that these roundtables of us um, being able to make ourselves available to attend have been very beneficial to also continue to connect information um, and ensure that we're just having all these different considerations when looking at this new funding as a piece there too of that. But of course, you know, sometimes there's a limitation of um, how far reach we can have on some of the roundtables, and so therefore the 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 written comment is always the best ideal way to. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, I think one one thing that we wanted to have um, explained again. You know, we kind of covered this before, um, but we needed it done a little bit slower so that it can be translated better. Um, Tony, can you just uh, reiterate if there, if 504 or other lending um, is available for individuals who want to purchase a home as part of a family child care center? Yeah, so the 504 is is um, for commercial real estate. So a single family residence that is zoned that is zoned for um, you know operating a business zoned commercial could be used to operate a child care facility. Um, but but it can't be used to live on site and operate the facility at the same time. It's only for the operation of of the business. Um, so you you couldn't buy a home and then operate like a home daycare there, live on site um, at the same time. There has to be the business itself has to occupy fifty one percent or more of the space, and it would just be too kind of commingled if you're living on site and operating the business there to, to really work. Perfect. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, I think we have covered the majority of the questions. I think we have a number of those that we would want to make sure we kind of pin for future um, webinars or, you know, briefs that allow for people to um, kind of learn more about all the things that happened this past year in the budgeting process that allows for additional um, support for our child care sector, especially as those things start to roll out and become a reality for us and not just, oh, we, we did it, we got, we were able to advocate for these dollars, but as the dollars start to go out, how to access them, how to, um, how to know that they're available. So we will make sure to think about those things. Um, see anything else one other thing if if any of the panels have any other questions for each other or if you wanted to provide any final remarks in the last few minutes that we have and we also in the chat put in a link to a feedback form if you are able to take one minute to do that as well so um, if it's okay i'd love to ask a question to jennifer so jennifer i am really um uh you know, impressed by the commitment for these different phases to expand your your program. And I just wondered, how has it been to do some of the private fundraising? And, you know, like just the timeline of how much you thought you could raise, how long it took. I know COVID was in the middle of that, but just a little bit of your experience of how that's been. That's a great question. I think one that we continue to ask ourselves as we're just into financing phase two, and we still have several more to go. And so we've been trying to balance these uh, state funding that could come down and holding off from starting a capital campaign, so to speak, in order to take advantage of these facility fundings that we're hoping will come through. And then COVID hit, and then now it's back on the table and it's very exciting, we're kind of waiting. So with our private foundations, I think part of that is we've been building those relationships for a very long time and our reputation um so it's we're continually looking for additional funding opportunities and really looking to align our expansion planning with those private foundations without tapping into those private foundations that already support the rest of the important work that we're doing as we know facility funding is kind of its own particular 
bucket that we're trying to finance without harming the rest of our program. So it's it's a, it's a challenge, and I think it is about exploring. We've that's why we've been putting out kind of requests far and wide um, in order to keep that those options open. Thank you. We had a question in Spanish that I'm trying my best to um, translate. Um, there is a, it's about how- I believe it's how to expand uh, my uh, garderia, which would translate to child care facility or nursery. Si Maria es en lugar o en un centro, is it, a, is it in her home? Or her in her center. That would be there. There's sometimes different answers to that question. And uh, Jessica has also put another question that uh, can I apply for the 504 program uh, from my uh, facility, like the facility I already have? Yes, you. Um, you, you can apply if you already operate a facility, again, zone commercial, a for-profit business, you know, that's not run in the house that you live in. Um, you know, you can, you can definitely apply. Uh, our website was in the, I think our website was in the chat earlier, but I can definitely put it in here again. Um, and there's a link to apply. Um, I think if, if my information can be shared, I could certainly reach out to one of our business development officers or loan officers afterwards and put, put them in contact with you for a little bit, you know, richer discussion on, you know, what some of the requirements are. Great. And Angie, it was in a family child care center. Yeah, so I would suggest them reaching out to Tony's organization. Um, they are one organization that offers that potential financial product. And Tony, I'm sure you, I'm almost, and Monica Guevara, is she Spanish speaking on your organization? Yes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. they have they have Spanish speaking capabilities that, so if they reach out, they could uh, assist them. Okay. And Monica is very familiar with the childcare sector. She actually had put together like a, a TA training, uh, you know, about how to kind of build out your like getting ready to be loan ready for a childcare provider. And so I think she's a great resource that, on Tony's team that we, you know, you should really consider to reach out to her um, if you have more interest in how to access private capital. And and the other things also maybe for Dr. Lupe to answer is, are these child care facilities funds going to be eligible for centers as well as homes? And will those homes be able to apply for expansion? Thank you for the question, Angie. And um, yes, um, both center-based as well as homes are eligible for this funding. And um, in Spanish, sí, los fondos que estamos ahorita disponibles. The funds that are available now uh, uh, will be for the people who want to apply, who are the home providers and also the centers. I believe that we will have, uh, we were going to provide more information by late October, but we hope uh, to keep on receiving information regarding what is it that you want to see. Uh, uh, what is your preference? That is what we are looking for now. Information about that. Our time is up today. I'd really like to thank all of you for joining us and sharing your expertise in such a concise and graceful way. We were able to answer so many questions live, which was great. I learned a lot. Um, I'm sure everyone who joined us will um, you be able to either review the slides or, you know, we're going to put this on YouTube if you want to see a certain person's answer. Um, and thank you again, Erica, for the opportunity to moderate this discussion. I'm looking forward to working with all of you in the near future. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Dr. Lupe. Hi, And uh, thank you, Angie. Oh, am I muted? Um, thank you, Angie. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks to all of you. And 
I would like to thank all the participants that were here. Um, we will refine our events moving forward, especially the Spanish translation. We were very fast speaking today. We got many calls like, please speak slower. So, but this is one of the feedbacks that we would love to get from you. If you can please answer the feedback form. Um, to let us know how you like or not this, this event. It will improve us to uh, plan future ones. And I would like to invite everyone, everyone, including our speakers, to join us in the future, the last two roundtable events that are going to be um, on Thursdays next week and the week following. And it will be uh, on ECE facilities, but one is co-location and another one is on how elected officials can partner with us in the expansion and the improvement of child care facilities. So thank you again for, to everyone. And um, I hope to see you all soon in one of our events and our community, in our community efforts to improve child care facilities. If you have any questions, visit our website, buildupcalifornia.org. Thank you.